So at this point, building a point on the ground shouldn't be that difficult. It should put together everything sort of we've been doing already. Let's go over some of the finer points though. Again, it's amazing to me always as a coach when you just change the elements of the environment, how people forget the concepts. So again, palms and hands can face each other, palms and hands can go up. People ask all the type of questions about other positions. Listen, if you just start with the simple stuff, you'll get the biggest bang for your buck. The key thing here is to get, again, understanding of using instead of the straps as tension the ground, using the ground itself. So again, when I line up, and then I just move from my bottom up, I'm right in that plank and I should be very active. So I should see a little trembling in the upper body. I should see the glutes being tight, but not me squeezing the glutes, but me pushing the balls of the feet. If I do so, it's very hard for me to change my pelvic alignment. Pushing to the feet creates that little pelvis, posterior tilt in the pelvis that locks you into place. That's so important when we're pressing overhead. So when we're playing like this, the goal is not just to get really tight, it's to understand how to create those little locks, how to create the tension in the right areas. Watching for the things like elbow flare, watching for the hands coming together, watching for the shoulders to round forward. That's why the alignment is so important. Now at the same time, how can we sort of amplify the tension that people are creating? Sometimes it's hard for people to keep that, is we can use a mini band around the forearms. And what we want here is them to actually keep a stretch here. Now when you do so, we want to be very careful that people don't let their elbows flare, but this feels pretty weird in doing so. So the goal is actually people will tend to drive their elbows in a little harder the more they create tension out. So if I create tension in the band first, I already have tension in my lats as I go into place, I feel nice and strong. Now I want to keep that tension, if anything, cue, sort of rolling my thumbs out, and that really drives up the tension in that lat and upper scapular area. So I get a ton of feedback from the motion and it allows me to get more benefit out of that simple plank. So what we see Jessica doing at first is putting her forearms in the position. We'll show you several different layers of this movement, but what we're doing is we're emulating the ground with the foot straps here. So a couple key concepts. We want to make sure that we're in a position where she can tolerate the stress, but not so upright where she can't get her shoulders in the right position. So I'm going to have her move back slightly so that her elbows can come underneath her shoulders and she's going to be pressing down into the unit. So I should see a nice about 90 degree angle with that forearm and elbow. So if she's too far away I can just quickly adjust her a little bit and make sure she's nice and tight. If people start to wing away Remember, we're disconnecting that lat and we're not getting that core stability that we want. So you see how she's creating a nice little fist too. She's amplifying the tension she's getting and just teaching this, pressing down for 10 to 15 seconds and relax Jessica, is a great way to get people to understand that's how we connect the lat and core together. So as you guys know, the chains that we're looking for predominantly, just to keep things simple, are lat, core, and glutes. So we have lat and core core connecting, let's talk about connecting the glutes into this equation. So again, what's so important about establishing this plank is teaching Jessica her lower body as well as create tension in her arms. Now, what she's going to do is she's going to emphasize still pressing into those handles, but now she's going to press into the balls of her feet. When she's pushing in the ground, so if I were just to slightly tap her, she's nice and stable. If she were to lose ground contact, relax her feet a little bit, Jess, I can move her quite easily, and she, you see the tension that we lose throughout her chain. See, there's not no back, good position, and a safe arm position. Relax for a second, Jessica. So by packing the shoulder in this manner and creating this tension, we're also building scapular stability. So one of the things that we're looking at is this is a very safe way to start building integrity of the shoulder joint as well. So if you are dealing with people that have a history of shoulder problems, this is a very uh, non-intimidating way to start getting them to learn how to use the right muscles, create that tension that's going to make them successful in the movement. So if Jessica gets in that position one more time, when we are in here, we want to just create this tension for about 10 to 15 seconds. You know, the old adage, you can't sprint a mile is very you know, appropriate here, where if we want to create a lot of tension, we're going to make sure she, can't, she doesn't have to hold it for long periods. And relax, Jessica. So we're going to show you a couple ways. Now, what you can do is about 10 to 15 second hold, 5 second relax, 
do it again, you do five or six reps, you build up still that volume of work. So we're gonna show you how we can also layer progression to this movement by just adding a little bit more challenge by integrating a little bit more grip in the equation. Those of you that saw our shoulder restoration course may be familiar that we add an ultimate sandbag here and the reason we do so is the hand tension. So one thing a lot of people do with our drills is go, can I use something else? And if again, you're not integrating these proper concepts, you're not gonna get the same impact upon the movement. One of the things that you'll find is there's many exercises that look similar, but you don't get the same result because the details dictate everything. So just actually grabbing onto the ultimate sandbag stuff and trying to actually pull it apart actually creates a greater tension down that chain of Latin core. So we're gonna amplify that connection. Now, if she moves her feet back, you see how she still can keep her elbows in close to her body, but keep the forearms going out, and I should see no saggy bag. Those of you that have done our pelvic control course know that's a key concept, that we should see no saggy bag, and relax, Jessica, when we're doing these motions. So what we can do is, again, use that as an avenue to build volume. 10 seconds, 15 seconds of work, five second break. Creating a lot of tension is quite fatiguing. So you want to make sure that we, uh, again, progress people adequately over time. So once we get in that position and we have that baseline, then we can start adding a challenge of obviously we can move her back, that's one option, or we can extend the lever arm in the upper body. So creating that tension again, she's gonna create tension down in the feet and the forearms. She's gonna slowly try to extend the bag out above her as she pulls apart. And the reason I really want you guys to see this as she pulls her elbows in nice and hard is basically this looks like the beginnings of a really good overhead press. Nice job, Jess. And you see how she doesn't dump in her pelvis if she was going to do so and relax. We would have to cue her to using her feet, okay? So if you see the pelvis collapsing, diving in fo uh, into the movement, usually people have lost ground tension. Obviously, if you're cueing that and they still can't do it, you just may not have them at the appropriate angle. You may have to bring them a little bit more vertical. But this is a great way to introduce that concept because when she's pressing overhead, she's actually pushing down, creating tension in her hands and her elbows and her lats to press the weight up. Pressing the weight overhead has far less to do with you using your shoulders to push overhead than it does creating proper tension foundation from the ground up and almost your arms are just an extension of okay so when we start getting more vertical and one of the things I like to do is implement it as one arm at a time meaning instead of trying to press both arms up that takes a little bit more thoracic mobility and people have a hard time maintaining their tension so having just one arm go up will allow us to actually see how the different mobility uh, factors in from side to side as well as also giving the opportunity to create more tension and ground engagement which should help again give you better shoulder motion so how do we do that because again, once we start doing a one-arm press for people, they don't have that feedback upon the opposing side. So we're gonna show you a couple of different strategies. One I really love with a lever bell, and one we're gonna start with just a little easier in case you don't have a lever bell, is just using a simple band setup. Now it's worth noting, you know, when we're doing the arc press, the press outs, or anything with a band, we want to be aware of the band angle. So in this case, if I'm doing anything directly horizontal, I want the band to be in line with my arm. If I'm doing an arc press, obviously I want a different angle upon the band. So, obviously if I'm gonna press straight up here, I want the band up. And how you hold it is not super crucial. If you like thumb thread through, that's fine. If you're fine in this position as well. Whatever doesn't upset the client. What's more important in here, again, what I do, sort of like what we did with the airy sled and the press outs, is having the right joint angle here. So again, I'm not having my hand up high, I'm having it line with my uh, belly button, and I'm creating tension against the handle. Now what I'm gonna do is start either tall kneeling, or what I'm gonna show you guys in a moment is half kneeling. Because again, whenever I'm half kneeling, I have to fight a little bit harder in this motion. Again, don't sort of jump progression. We could also do this standing, in case this doesn't work out for your client. But watch what, what, for my shoulder. What I'm gonna do is, in a moment, I'm gonna use this press out motion. I'm gonna press out the band first. The reason I'm gonna do that is that's gonna give me tension already established on this side. So if you imagine me holding the kettle on this side, I'm already creating tension before I'm even moving. So a lot of people, they need that tension before they start moving. What happens for a lot of people, and the reason they get out of position is they start to move the weight, then they try to create tension or they don't know how to create tension at all. So again, we're using the band, not as a chest exercise, but to keep that cross pattern tension in the body, get you to use your feet a little bit more. So if I bring the bell up in position, so I'm in the rack, 
Now, don't get too fixated on which leg's forward. For right now, I'm doing opposites. I'm going to press with the band and my feet, get that tension first. Now, this feels nice and strong. And I'm not using a killer band, just enough where I can create some tension. Bring it back in. I can set the belt down. So the idea upon the band, what I'm getting here, is this activation and tension, which will make you and your client feel stronger. And, in, and uh, because of that, the shoulder will feel more stable. And you'll get more from the ground up. So again, one of the big points with the lift program is describing you why different tools are used and how they use it changes the exercise. So obviously, if you don't have some of this equipment, we still want you to feel very accessible to all these exercises. Most people have bands, but maybe you may not have a lever belt. Let me describe the difference here in doing the same motion. So with the lever belt, as we discussed earlier, I have that little instability this way. So again, as I press out, I really want to create that grip tension, I actually get more stabilization through the upper arm and the grip than with the band. Does that mean that the band is no good? That you need to run out and get lever bells? No, but if you have access to them, they're a much more efficient way of actually building those patterns and we can do some other great things. So for example, and again, the nice thing is I can change the higher I grip, the less intense it is. But if I grip about midway through and I grab my kettlebell, so again, I want to create that tension first out and that really helps my press. Okay, I can sequence it, press out. You can see it's challenging to stabilize. Come up. I can even increase that tension by just creasing the joint angle here. Now I don't have quite as much feedback, but I have more st stabilization required in the exercise. And I'm getting tons of feedback in the shoulder and the core and the feet all at the same time. So great tools to combine once you understand the concepts. Start easy, I could also just start by holding the lever bell out. And as someone's pressing, they're constantly having to engage their hand there and their trunk to sort of balance out the movement of the body. But again, I want you to understand why the different tools are used and what they bring to different situations. All right guys, so we're gonna start introducing more of the back pressing in a moment. So when we have two hands fixated upon the implement like we do with the ultimate sandbag, obviously we need a little bit more shoulder and thoracic mobility because both arms have to move at the same time. Obviously they need to move hopefully in the same direction. Now this is a little bit more forgiving than let's say a barbell because with the barbell we start in an externally rotate position of the shoulders. So being in this neutral position is a little bit more forgiving to a lot of people. They can integrate the lats a little bit more. They're not in that sort of extended position of the shoulder. In other words, a lot easier for people. Now there's a lot of nuance that still comes into play because a lot of people get uh, a lot of mistakes upon cleaning and pressing the ultimate sandbag. So before Jessica does it, let's go over a couple of those points. One is even though you won't be able to see Jessica's hands, you want to see that the hands are lining up either shoulder width or a little bit wider. So one reason we're going to use a larger ultimate sandbag is because the neutral grip handles are going to be wider, allowing her to get in that position. For a lot of you, you're going to see that when we press a smaller ultimate sandbag, we'll grab the outside bag of itself to create that tension, but also put the uh, hands in better alignment. Now, a lot of people, because you won't be able to see your hands, get the mistake that when the bag gets upon the fist, they let the fist extra, uh, extend. So again, just like a cowboy, like anything else, we don't want to see that extension, that wrist, we start to lose tension down the chain. So even though you may not be able to see Jessica's hands, she's still carrying tension against those handles, and more importantly, she's creating tightness in that, uh, in that wrist, creating if not just a neutral wrist, a little bit of flexion. So she wants to have that tension before she even starts pressing. So again, she's going to look like she's in that standing plank motion. So Jessica cleans the weight up. She's going to clean up on her fist. Nice. She's going to get her feet set. We can see her hands are wider than her shoulders. She's going to create a lot of tightness in the hand, push through the feet, and she's going to press, press over the crown of her head. Nice. As she finishes a nice alignment, she's going to pull down by pushing through her feet, right back into place. So watch her head, how she doesn't really have to move herself as she presses that good arc. Nice. She keeps that plank. She's in good alignment. Come back down just and relax for a second. So I'll have her turn towards me in a moment so you guys can see the other joint angles. But what you want to see is that nice alignment of that elbow is aligned with the ear, down the shoulder, down the hip, down the foot. If you're starting to see that ribs lead the movement or you're starting to see a large amount of movement through the lumbar spine, that's when you know you've lost tension in the feet. So again, whenever we're seeing compensation of movement, again, the two key places generally tend to be the low back, the extra curvature, or the extension of the rib cage. We're losing tension in the body, 
We start on the feet, we go to the hands because both can be pointing that roll. So Jessica faces me now, I want to see a little different angle. So again, she's going to clean the weight upon her fist. So right from the get-go, you should see that nice straight plank. I don't have any bend her knees because I'm creating tension from the ground up. She's going to push through her feet, press over the crown of her head. So again, we have that nice alignment. She's nice and stable. She doesn't have the large curvature in her low back. She pulled it down with her elbows coming to ribs. One more time, just feet, feet, feet. Nice. And you see how she didn't have that sort of wiggle into the motion and come back down with the weight. So what I mean is a lot of times as people tire, they start to sort of wiggle into the motion. They're trying to get leverage rather than remembering to ground themselves down into the feet because the feet are what creates that lock in the legs. So it's not lock out your legs. It's pushing your feet harder. If I push my feet really hard, the legs will naturally lock out. The glutes become tight. You've set that foundation for the press and it's going to look beautiful just like Jessica did. And the nice thing about the ultimate stamina is just slightly unstable enough where you're going to get a little feedback if you don't have the right position or alignment in your motion. In a moment, we're going to show you how you can do this with the smaller bags whether it's people don't have the movement accuracy to clean it upon the fist, or they need a little bit more feedback upon the bag to get the movement really well. Now, small ultimate sandbags, we take advantage of this more dimension, they make them more compact, they make them more stable. So this is, again, an element that people don't appreciate when it comes to ultimate sandbags, is how dimension plays such a big role in the exercise that we're producing. So what Jessica's actually gonna do, because if she grabbed the neutral grip handles, her hands would be too close, I mean, they'd be inside her shoulders when she went to press overhead. We're actually gonna grab the bag itself. So remember, we're using grip to stimulate some of the shoulder complex. So when she grabs on the bag, she's gonna actively be pulling it apart as well. So she's gonna get nice and low. Now you guys can start from an elevated position if you couldn't get down this low. But she wants to bring the bag right here. Now, at this point, she's trying to break it apart. So again, we don't want a saggy bag. Push into the feet, she's gonna press about above the crown of the head, nice. And again, we should see a very similar alignment with the hands a little bit wider than the shoulders or in line with the shoulders, not the hands inside the shoulders. Now it's great that she gets to integrate that grip with her feet. Press one more time, Jess. Nice job. And we'll come back down. So again, if we want to create a little bit more feedback upon the motion, some people are going to feel stronger because that extra tension in the hands helps them stimulate the ash in the core. This can be a great learning progression for people going bilaterally overhead, which like we mentioned, it does take a little bit bigger demand in upper body mobility.